colleagues, um, Ulrich, it's um, a pleasure to be here. Um, Botan Bogner, uh, Professor and Edgar Teffel, Chair, and our Chair in Architecture at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. I bring in a different culture as I have been involved in uh, Japan for some 50 years following uh, the developments there. And lately I hear uh, in the general discourse, as much as my experience on the ground, um, nature is coming back. I will tell you why that is coming back, because through all the uh, years, and I'm showing here the troubled world mm -hmm. in which we now find ourselves in a variety of ways, political, economic, environmental upheavals. And, and the pollution, global warming, uh, and the continued destruction of the environment. Now that has been compounded by the pandemic which we experience. And then eventually I will raise one issue which is the shrinking of Japan's population. It is something new which I have uh, collected information about. Um, I will not expand on that. I will not um, an ethnologist or a sociologist, but it increases an in interesting question how it could uh, lead to greening the environment, but more about that later on. Um, of course, Japan, as we can see, there are natural disasters. Natural, which is nature, right? So nature has been always uh, there. Now, this issue which we talk about that is a current uh, troublesome environment, it is uh, going back in Japan, uh, uh, perhaps after the war, when industrialization was reckless, um, the um, uh, environment was practically destroyed, if you remember the uh, Minamata disease and so on. I mean, um, uh, the. Um, the sea was, and the mercury was wet in there, and, and so on. It was simply uncontrolled and uncontrollable. That was basically the progress of Japan, where in 10 years they can double the uh, GPA and, uh, <laughs> the, and then the, in, uh, the income. At the same time, of course, because of this progress and the population grew, they went into the cities, they overcrowded. The Japanese cities have been always uh, dense and, and uh, land was always expensive, but it went really beyond any uh, uh, sort of previous uh, density. So the reason I am saying that uh, now Japan is turning back, and should I say when that was the case uh, in the 70s and so on, that was uh, the destruction or forgetting about the environment of nature completely. But Japan has been a culture like so many others, uh, a culture which grew out from uh, that very intimate relationship of uh, uh, nation with the land, with the, um, how they cultivate it. And even, as you may know, Japan um, derives itself both as a nation and as a land from uh, the uh, sun goddess, that's what appears on the flag of Japan. And it is worshipped, as you can see in the Isa Shrine, which is the most sacred, uh, sacred Shinto shrine. So it was there, and throughout the years or centuries, it has been cultivated. Uh, architecture's relationship with nature, I'm showing this perhaps very uh, popular and better known example of the Katsura Villa, but in this intimate relationship within architecture is not a primer or prime object, but it is simply part of that uh, landscape. And this is a, a strolling garden here. And that was um, further enhanced by the architecture's um, definition, and definition is always the borderline between outside and, and inside. And take a look at this in Nanzenji Temple, uh, this layered, ambiguous uh, zone wherein uh, you can uh, shift it either to outside or inside. 
So this is a very crucial uh, part of, say, traditional Japanese architecture and its relationship with nature. The next one I'm showing, this is from Kyoto, this is from the 17th century. That's a, a private villa, was a poet who lived here and designed also his villa. Um, I'm showing this because the removal of these sliding panels, uh, Fusuma and Shoji, you could have an, an, an absolute direct relationship with the outside. If that, the Japanese practically thought that they were still living in the nature. Needless to say, every material in the house or any uh, building, for that matter, is of wood and or natural materials. Stone is very, very limited. Now, not everybody lived in this large estates with beautiful villas like uh, nobility, but in urban residences like in Kyoto, nature is um, brought in by way of these pocket gardens. And you can see um, a number of uh, well, plants here, how they are dispersed within the matrix of uh, the uh, uh, residence here. You can still see quite a number of them uh, in Kyoto and perhaps many other parts of uh, the country. Now, I'd like to go through um, a certain strategies what uh, Japanese architects after the 70s, I would say, uh, try to uh, follow or implement to uh, bring uh, nature uh, back to the, uh, 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 well, the city or architecture or vice versa and with that reduce architecture's impact on the environment. Uh, this is a photo of Osaka in 1974. I went to Japan in 1973, so this is a, a photo which I took actually a helicopter. It's dense, and if you look into this, this has no nature whatsoever. These are not traditional residences, these are well, the modern era which has um, uh, populated the, uh, the uh, cities with buildings of nondescript uh, <coughs> uh, kind of quality. And as Tada Wando grew up here and experiencing this environment, he was appalled. And so there was a movement in the 1970s led mm -hmm. by Anto who actually said, no, the city is our enemy. I have to reject whatever is going on, pollution, um, noise, and everything what you can imagine in this very dense and uncontrolled environment. So he said, OK, I will do the private residence and center it onto a courtyard. And that courtyard is something which will bring in nature. Now, he was considered at that time as the urban guerrilla who was fighting against uh, or with the city and tried to capture uh, natural phenomena. First of all, what? Air, sky, light, and so on, even rain. And so, as you can see, well, one more thing here, if you haven't seen this uh, prime uh, example, a paradigm of our, uh, on those architecture, it is uh, on the courtyard, uh, centered on that, and the resident is divided in two parts. So in order to go from your bedroom to your bathroom, you have to go outside and expose yourself to, uh, well, the natural uh, elements. That was a radical introduction of the forces, to the forces of nature. But then, he has the, um, the light and shadow. This is what he has been known for. What you are looking at here, a structural being keeping the roof above your head, is casting a shadow. It's almost like a sundial. So when we photograph this, we have to wait, but then it moves. It really inscribes, well, should I say, maybe large word, the cosmic forces. It's light as it is in the shadow, what it has. Now, eventually, whoops, uh, the newer generation today, which uh, Ando is 41, uh, born in 41, so he's uh, uh, 82 years old, a newer generation is a little bit more sensitive to, um, well, the environment. I think they have something. No, 
just that you see it. So um, the new architecture is quieter. Now I am talking about that because that was the uh, uh, bubble economy when there was money for everything. You know what a bubble economy is? Everything could go and uh, get off the ground. Uh, incredible uh, buildings, uh, if you could call them architecture at all. And sure enough, the environment again took the back seat. So this new architecture with the newer generation uh, following perhaps the uh, footsteps of some of the older ones like Ondo, uh, that architecture is quieter, simpler, lighter, less ego-driven. As we know, we talked about it. And indeed, more part of the environment. Here I just uh, flash up a few names. Atelier Bawa maybe uh, is familiar to you, Tezuka Architect, and uh, uh, Sejima, and then here Kango Kuma. Now, something here which, okay, thank you, that is something. All right, now Ando uh, remains one of the uh, the champion of um, uh, connecting his architecture to nature. Eventually, sure enough, in the circumstances, it's, uh, he was more willing to open his architecture to the environment. In, in fact, unlike in the, uh, the urban uh, setting, here it is his Rocco Chapel of 1966. What is interesting about this building is um, the how you approach this uh, chapel, or in the church, as you call the uh, uh, Rocco Chapel or Church, 1986, it is this very long and twisting uh, approach. It is certainly not the, uh, the Christian typology to enter the church. And so it is much more a Shinto shrine under the disguise of a wedding chapel. We'll more about that later on. Now take a look at this. There is this long tube. You go towards something which you don't know where would lead you. At the end of the tunnel, you see nature. And then you have to turn twice in order to get into the uh, church wherein the, uh, this church is now exposed uh, to an um, enclosed garden here. So he, what uh, I'm quoting him, he is sort of architecturalizing nature. But the long path, as it happens in many cases of Ondo, it is to um, expose you to uh, the experiencing of nature in flashing up. And here is a a wonderful example, which is, well, another one, but this one is a Buddhist temple. And that's 1991 in Awaji Island. As the uh, aerial photograph shows, or the satellite photograph shows, this is a, a, a church you act, uh, access from uh, the existing, but this is a funerary, uh, uh, or a, how should I say, a cemetery here and then the Buddhist temple is right here. What he does here, you approach here the, uh, the building, but immediately there is a, a blank wall with a cut out openings. Then what you do, you face another one which is curving, where I am going. This is an environmental hide and seek. In order to uh, expose yourself, discover or uh, so to say, nature. So let's, let's enter. The, this is the uh, church, which is based, a church, a temple, which is nothing but basically a roof with a, uh, 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 you know, uh, a water on the uh, 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 rooftop and a uh, basin and with, uh, uh, you know, the two walls. Take a look at two freestanding walls. It is delaying the approach or the entry to. Uh, the building. This is typical in Shinto shrines, where in the approach or the journey is as important, if not more so, than the arrival. More about that later on, but let's enter this one. And here are that, as I am facing on the uh, upper left hand corner, there is this wall with a sim simple cut through. And then you enter facing the wall, then where you go, you find it out, and then fashion of nature. Then uh, this is a, a photograph on the left when you are uh, leaving behind this kind of horn 
shaped space. And then you go around again the wall and then down into the water with the lotus flowers as the typical uh, signs, as you know, Buddha well, sits on the lotus uh, flower in any case. So here it is, this pond. Uh, uh, extremely beautiful journey, experience, and can Gokuma does the same thing. It is very prevalent today that many architects really try to choreograph a path to uh, enter the building. And here is this in Tokyo, in the busiest part, it is along uh, Omotesando, which is the Champs-Élysées of, of uh, Tokyo. So it's really a popular environment. You can see it on the area of photograph and there is this garden there, right in the midst of the most uh, heavily built, uh, contemporary, popular, very expensive area, and the world apart. And so in order to enter that, this photograph um, shows from the uh, uh, air, this is basically the entrance here. I don't know if you've seen my cursor. But you don't enter to this, um, compound from here directly. You enter right there. And then you face, well, a bamboo wall. And then you start walking along that. And here is the uh, uh, site plan. So you walk along this one, they turn around, and then you enter. Let's take a look at this. This is the journey. On the left side, you have real bamboo wall. And on the right side, a bamboo grove. And then the pebbles and so on and then you move, turn again. This is the kind of hide and seek, which is absolutely typical in Japanese gardens, in um, uh, traditional gardens and so on. And what Walter Gropius went to see the Katsuko Villa and experience this garden, he said, uh, this is nonsense. You can do this. This he, is episodic. It uh, unfolds in uh, the human experience. And the, or the whole thing is reconstituted in your memory and imagination. So that's the Japanese uh, garden or the environment all in all involving nature. Here, this is a more contemporary uh, revisit of the same idea. And, and then here it is when they enter the building, then facing the garden here, which is a, a beautiful, absolutely beautiful garden. Um, which I unfortunately don't have time to show. Now, moving on, here is Kengo Kuma, the designer of the 2020 uh, uh, Olympic Stadium, which was actually opened in 21 because of the pandemic. And uh, here he uses uh, as much as possible a, a lot of wood. He collected the wood <coughs> from the entire nation, as you can see on the lower right hand side. The wood comes from everywhere in the uh, nature. This is a national stadium. Well, um, perhaps a little gesture. But he also, perhaps for the first time, puts vegetation on this public space. These are open, basically, uh, supposed to be 24-7. Uh, and uh, well, when I photographed it, still the, uh, the plants are quite uh, small. So here is the greening one, here is the uh, stadium from another uh, view. That is a, a large public building, so he introduces that nature. There is one other building here, it's in Paris, which uh, is uh, not yet off the uh, uh, drawing board because of uh, permission issues. But here is this hotel, which is basically, as it is envisioned, inside and outside a green forest or a jungle, if you look at the uh, left side photo. Now here it is. Uh, the Japanese city is really, really uh, densely built. And uh, so where are the areas where you can bring back some green areas? Well, we know that the rooftops and in between uh, terraces are, are often turned into gardens. But here, the railroad tracks and in between them and yeah, you can see, uh, well, an experimental uh, deployment of uh, uh, green area. An even younger architect, Tsu Fujimoto, perhaps 
not familiar uh, name to you, but has published in 2008 a book. And this is something very interesting to, well, read. It's a very small, but the idea, primitive future, that's almost saying what I am doing, back to nature. Or was that Jean-Jacques Rousseau who did the same thing? Well, of course, it's in a different way. But he identifies in this book the nest and the cave as two prototypes of human uh, residences or abodes uh, to say. In the book, he also uh, talks quite a bit about the tree, the tree house, and so on. And uh, with that, the forest and clouds. These are references to natural phenomena. So let's see, here it is. It's perhaps difficult to uh, see that how this one is a, a tree. But he says that here, the residence, which is a 90, uh, 2011 building, is basically like the branches of a tree. And then you leave. This is nothing basically, as you can see, both on the photograph and the model, which was exhibited in MoMA in New York, is a series of platforms and almost open completely to the outside. Curtains are dividing, uh, perhaps visually, the outside and the inside. Um, a very interesting one, and the diagram which is in the center of this uh, screen shows that how uh, yeah, people could uh, freely live. Don't necessarily take this as, as uh, you know, face value in this case, but it's an interesting reference to it. You can think a lot of whatever you want to. Here is the forest. And this is an absolutely, I don't think that any building could be more minimalist than uh, this one, which is Junya Ishigami, a disciple and a co-worker of Kazuyo uh, Sejima, <coughs> of part of the Sana group. And this one is a work uh, shop of a university, uh, done in Atsuki. Now take a look at this. There are 305 steel columns, I call, quote, unquote, randomly distributed, nothing else in this building. There are no washrooms, there are no nothing else. If you want to run for your life, you go to the next building. Meaning mm -hmm. want to shake hands with the mayor, right? You know, we know what it is. This is the forest. This is the typology of the forest. Now again, uh, we are perhaps uh, either stunned or uh, marveled, but this is something which uh, experimented. We will see another building back. Uh, Junior Ishigami. Here in the building, which is closed and, <coughs> and glass, uh, he's conscious about that. It reflects back the cherry trees all around, as you can see even here, although no cherry blossoms at this time. Kengo Kuma follows this with a small chapel in uh, 2019, where in the birch, the trees, trunks are the, the structure, and then it's entirely glass, uh, sort of enveloped in this uh, natural landscape in, in it. Going beyond, here is the forest. This one is um, by Tezuka Architects. The only interesting thing about it is this wall, the backdrop, which has been computer uh, punctured by a program, which then creates, the, by way of the incoming light, the impression of a forest through which the, the leaves, uh, the light comes into this uh, small church at the university. This, uh, with Su Fujimoto designs in Budapest, that's the uh, House of Hungarian Music, in a uh, already uh, forested or uh, uh, kind of wooded area, and uh, produces this film. Now, there were existing uh, trees on the site. I was there when uh, this was built. The trees were extremely carefully protected, surrounded, and the construction went around. The building was designed in a way that these trees could go through them. And here you have a, an idea, inside and out. In addition to that, here the ceiling is an, an aluminum, oxidized aluminum, which uh, sort of alludes to um, uh, the, the, the leaves in, in the fall, uh, as you can see 
Um, and here is the uh, structure. It's basically a floating disk very lightly, and this is how you look at it you know, from inside. Uh, so Fujimoto, the nest. He designs a house down in um, Oita, South Japan, which is, as you can see, the three uh, surrounding walls. Where are, uh, the outside is basically, as you can see on the photo, is the garden, is the environment. He again architecturalizes. Then the next one is the living room and, and dining and so on, and then the kitchen is theirs. And here in the center of that, one after the other nestled in uh, one another. You can see it also vertically in the uh, uh, slide uh, at the, at the section of the building, the nest. Kuma does what? Kuma goes in a completely different way. This is a building in Sydney, Australia, when he waves wooden uh, material along, indeed, almost like a nest. Well, here it, of course, is a man-made one, not quite the birds, but he goes on. And he does another one. Again, I, what I'm trying to say that what he does is a, a, a wide variety of screens modulating the relationship between inside and outside. Rarely does he use flat glass. So here it is, again, weaving uh, the, uh, uh, the boundary and even inside the building into uh, well, very tactile uh, surfaces, which of course also uh, lets you see through, and of course also inside. So Fujimoto, the same architect, the plan. He was invited uh, to this, uh, design something in the uh, uh, in London, the Serpentine Gallery, as, and and here it is. That is nothing else but. A uh, very thin um, steel orthogonal frame with glass platforms in there. And so you can see the photographs as you look at what, what happens here. That actually no wonder is that, yes, it's an outside uh, sort of construction, but the outline of the building is like a cloud, sort of fades in there. No definitive outline or contour of the building or uh, any uh, major war. Kendo Kuma, who is uh, really a, an artist in many ways, using a traditional woodwork, and uh, uses it also as, partially here, as uh, the um, uh, structure of the, of, of the building right here in front, in addition to providing the, uh, well, the outline or the boundary of the building. This is a, a little bit of a forest, a nest, and so on. And then here is the building itself, and the, the section shows on the outer that how it is also a structural element, or a structural pla uh, uh, entity, uh, the tectonics of the building. Or the other part where the elevator is, of course, is reinforced concrete, but this one here is entirely of wood. Well, the cave. Again, here we go with, um, so Fujimoto. This is an experimental building, so it is not in mass production. It is with uh, lumber, which uh, comprises is nothing else but huge 30 by 30 uh, centimeter lumber. And while this is additively done, but the, 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 the feeling of it is as if the space was carved away. And as you can see on the photographs now, this one has been outfitted with everything, kitchen and so on. You live, sit on the wooden elements here. Hmm. It is not mass produced, but was an interesting competition with uh, a sort of uh, experimental house. Ando. Ando comes back time and again, and now what I am trying to uh, show here is protecting the landscape or nature. When he was commissioned to design a museum in this beautiful Naoshima Island, this pristine uh, landscape, he decided to put the building as much as possible underground. And what it is, it's basically a cave. Although, as you can see when you enter here on the uh, upper right hand side, it is really entering a cave. Whoops, whoops, <coughs> I'm sorry. 
And their section also shows there are skylights and of course sunken court lights to provide light to the building. So this is one strategy when architecture disappears or consumed by nature. Land becomes, <coughs> in many ways, not just by building underground, a, a very important construction material or uh, architectural material. Kengo Kuma comes and he designs this small, very tiny building in the embankment of this uh, canal uh, of which uh, the museum is dedicated to. And you can see that how it is underground, both on the section and on the photograph, and so on. And then, here is, again, Junior Ishigami. You cannot do a cave more than what he did. It is a very, very complex design and construction. If anybody is interested in that, I can uh, touch upon that later on. But it is carved into the land, and it's not yet green on the top, because when I was there, it was just open. So, uh, there we go. But the, uh, Vegetation is sunken underneath and it uh, sort of greens the spaces inside. Here you can see the living room. By the way, it's also a small restaurant for 12 people. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, I, I am known for this. Here is the plan and the living room. All right. Under the, do, does it when uh, the Kansai International Airport was built and that was in 30 meter deep. Water, where does the earth come from? The island. He had went back in 2000 and then uh, replanted uh, it into uh, a nature park. Kengo Kuma, I want to hear his architecture. The first thing is he puts it down. This was already leveled. He built this, um, um, this observation in the land with two uh, cantilevered uh, platforms and reconstructed the land. All right, then he goes uh, into, because going underground is not always possible, quite clearly. He uh, says particularization of uh, the building, where in the uh, surrounding, surrounding uh, boundaries and much in the building is the smaller material or slats, in this case, wood. What he does here, he uses local material, local um, um, construction uh, power, and very often craftsmanship. Here are the references back to some uh, previous historic buildings, and of course the museum is on the Hiroshige, and there it is where uh, uh, the uh, woodblock print is already one precedent in this case. He's, uh, and I'm going through a little bit faster here. No, 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 don't, don't. Take your time, it's so interesting. Please take okay. it. I, 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 have been, I have been reminded of okay, the time. Okay. And, and, uh, all right. So here is this wooden bridge, which um, uh, is basically also a, a gallery. Um, way down in South Japan, in the middle of nature, it's a very small settlement, and it's developing. Take a look at the, uh, the construction here, which then brings us back to the, uh, the Buddhist temples in Nara, where in this bracketing system was a major structural uh, solution to support these huge roofs. Uh, cantilever out there. The roof will be, uh, we will be talking about it. In Zurich, uh, we, we will see this building in, um, that's the uh, Tamedia by Shigeru Ban, the, the uh, architect who uses what he says, paper tube. It's not really paper tube, it's really solid industrial material, but readily available. Here he uses Austrian wood, uh, lumber, which is manufactured, it's cross-laminated uh, uh, precisely, and no any uh, metal uh, joinery here. It's self-tightening uh, uh, structure. Uh, I was there and I could show you, I don't. It is a remarkable structure. The only complaint of mine that when it's finished, you don't see it outside being a, 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 a radio and uh, it's off limit to uh, the public. But here it is on the left side. He has another one in uh, uh, Japan, in Kyoto, and of course in Mats. If you haven't seen that museum, it's the uh, uh, extension of Sanjay Pompidou. Kuma comes with that, with the bamboo, his first uh, building at road. And I am now showing you a kind of material strategy. And this is especially uh, describing uh, 
Kumas building. Ondo works only in concrete. And many architects, well, uh, work steel or so, but Kuma has a palette of materials, natural, primarily, what he uses. Here it is, the bamboo, we have seen it before. Here it is again in China, north of Beijing, close to the, the Grand Wall. That's why the uh, title of the uh, building is the Great Bamboo Wall, because you can see the wall. All right, and here there are, as you can see, natural material, the reed on the left side, again, is a screen. So it's woven into a um, um, mesh, a uh, natural mesh. In Paris, he has a small chocolate uh, shop and then uses dried wood as, again, uh, the material. Or, here it is, adobe. This is the dried um, clay, uh, no firing here. This is sun-dried. And this is, again, the uh, uh, a small museum for one Buddha in uh, South Japan. A very interesting one, again, local material, no foot, uh, carbon footprint, and local work. And these are people who work this, are, who have been working with this for decades, or perhaps if we go back, in fact, perhaps centuries. Then Kuman goes into Switzerland in Waltz, as you know, that's where uh, Peter Zumthor has his famous uh, building the thermal mass and using the same stone and wood, again local material and local wood, to uh, build this headquarters of the Truffle uh, AG offices which deals with the uh, uh, providing stone to different construction companies. Thatch. That's a material which has been used very widely, but particularly in uh, very old uh, Shinto shrines and then sometimes even on our residential buildings. It is a material which weathers and it has to be changed like so many of the parts of the building and here it is in a contemporary setting. Now all in all what this brings us to is the idea of the vernacular and here is this highly um, modern Museum, meaning the museum is quite modern, but the building, if you take a look at it, is charred cedar. And that's, uh, uh, he uses here, and you can see the, uh, uh, well, how it is integrated in the garden. Another one which, uh, that's um, a disciple of uh, uh, Kuma, it's Hiroshi Nakamura, it's a brewery, and take a look at this again, uh, the vernacular, the roof. Now we are talking about architecture as landscape, using the roof as an uh, extension of the land. And he's very careful to make the pitch of the roof exactly the same as this uh, embankment which goes up there. And there's a very, very unique uh, roof also in terms of ventilation. Uh, that little section uh, at least refers to it. Then Kuma does, uh, again, something which is in now in Portland, Oregon. That's the, in the Japanese garden. Uh, and I'm showing you some pictures. How building is part of this natural, beautiful landscape. And then, of course, the journey, what you can see on the left side, starts through this gate and moves up there, winding on foot before you arrive onto this uh, landscape. And here is the, the view, another view. He goes to South Korea, Jeju Island, and again, architecture is part of the landscape. The buildings are covered by the local stone, and there's a very rocky area, and um, I'm not sure if it uh, shows completely, but it's the buildings practically disappear. Well, it's not a cave, not really underground, but it is, uh, well, covered by the land in China. That's a museum of uh, folk art in uh, one of the universities. Again, how the building is part of it. But not only that. And I go to uh, this, uh, I think to me, one of the most important things. What is the nature of nature? In nature, everything is recycled. Everything. And when we enter nature, that's the problem that we either recycle or not, or some of the materials that we produce are non-recyclable. But I think it is our duty to rethink, reuse, recycle, renovate, rebuild, reconnect. And I use this word repair, because it not just says 
repairing or improving on something, but it also means reconnecting. And that's architecture mm -hmm. and nature as the reconnection. And with that, really the repairing of the environment. Using that same um, uh, local material of, of demolished buildings in the tiles. This is a building which we have already seen um, previously. He uses again this one as suspended floating elements in front of the uh, facade, providing again a screen. Um, a brewery here. What is interesting about the building is not only the modesty of this building and the entire wood construction, but take a look at that facade on the left side. These are all windows of demolished buildings put together into a mosaic. And that comprises both outside and inside one of the most uh, interesting facades. And at the same time, it's about the art in the remote area of uh, Chicago. Here is another <coughs> area of uh, vernacular. It's in Kanazawa uh, 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 by uh, Fuji, restoring an old uh, tea house into a contemporary uh, uh, restaurant. Renovating a building in Tokyo, and that is a very, basically a, a previous painter, which was Masanari Murai, wonderful painter. And then using much of the demolished building, and in fact, a part of it, what you can see on the left side, enclosing that area, <coughs> then like a nest, protecting it. And that was the studio of uh, uh, Masanari Murai. That is in Tokyo and early All right, in China, this one is one of the renovation of a hutong. That's the traditional Japanese courthouse. And then he uses this as his office. He purchased the building, renovated it. He's not alone. Many Chinese architects today do that, um, fortunately. And so here it is. That one is a courtyard, and his office is around there. And there is this only curtain here. This is the, uh, the building and the, and the plan. You can see it from outside as you look into it. Uh, that one is, well, again, by Kuma. It's in Besançon, France. It's a museum and a cultural center, an existing storehouse. As you can see it right here. Well, I don't have the cursor anyway. Oh, somewhere here. There was a, a, a storehouse along the river, and then shipping uh, all sorts of goods. And that was reused completely. And, uh, and that, that's the museum proper on the right side. Is the, musical. Uh, photographs show the uh, building from different areas and then uh, some photovoltaic roofs in the green are mixed. Here is the old building which is then the lobby here what you see to the music. And the last building I believe yeah, is in, in Shanghai. The 1960s uh, by way of the cooperation of Soviet Union and China as you may know uh, the Soviet Union gave uh, this uh, previous shipyard uh, to the Chinese along the uh, river, and then it was, of course, industrial age gone, decommissioned, and it was there like a ruin, so to say nobody took care of it. And uh, with the uh, uh, developer or the owner, so to say, Kuma went into that and convinced them that it was worthwhile maintaining. So he completely redesigned and did the old and the new. This is the repair. I say it is not just nature and architecture, but it is the past and the present, which is connected in a seamless way. And that, of course, includes certain time dimension. Here is the building, which then shows the old structure, as you can see on the lower left photograph, and how he went in there and uh, turn it into really a museum. It's also a sort of a shopping area, a cultural center. There's a huge theater also here. Um, and now, this is what I have been uh, telling you at the very beginning. Japan reached its max population in 2008 to uh, 127 million. Since then, well, we knew that the birth rate was dropping way below the 2.1, and now it's 1.3. It is really uh, very low. And since 2008, Japan lost population yearly more than half a million. 
in effective numbers. If it goes until 2050, Japan's population goes back to 100 million or even lower. These are predictions. Uh, it's, it's a big problem. The uh, population is aging. The people who are over 65 are comprising a huge portion of the population, but at the same time, the young ones, the, uh, the really, uh, well, entering young ones into the society are shrinking. Who takes care of them? But at the same time, and this could be an interesting uh, issue to discuss, and here is the uh, 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 two maps, only in uh, Okinawa, which you can see with red, when the population is a little bit growing. Everywhere else, every sim uh, single prefecture, as they call it in Japan, uh, the number of live births are dropping. And then the darker, the, uh, the, the more, uh, of course, it is. Now, with that, it's a problem socially, but at the same time, they, they are talking about it in Hokkaido abandoned villages. Or the bears. Did we have it? <laughs> I was kidding a little bit yesterday. But then literally the bears show up at your footstep or your doorstep. So I tend to think with good policies, there could be some kind of equilibrium uh, maintained, wherein nature could be taking over many of these residents, previous residential areas, which have been abandoned by uh, the dozen dilapidated buildings and so on. Well, I think I leave it at that at the moment. I think I covered quite a bit of material. We can discuss some of them if you are interested in. Um, thank you. Yeah, many thanks. For me, as a layman in Japanese architecture, the most the most compelling aspect was this difference to Western concept as regards the principal relationship to nature. <coughs> uh, what are your impressions and your ideas from this other culture, yeah. which it is? Um, we talked yesterday about the praise of in the. Praise of Shadows, the book right. about them. Yeah. And you can see there are a lot of, in your examples, a lot of, yeah. of how these structures are, right. are used to mm -hmm. make variations of the light. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Praise of Shadows yeah. by Taniguchi. Okay, that uh, comes back to very old, uh, almost mythical. Uh, the, uh, the traditional building was built quite different from uh, the, the Western or Egyptian or Greeks. The first went up was the roof, because the structure is a wooden frame, very thin wooden frame. That was the first covered with the thatched roof or shingle, and that was the primordial gesture to cast shadow. Because when shadow was there, that was uh, possible for a human occupation. And then came, next one came, the floor, and then after that, the sliding panels and so on. All of them had to be changed from time to time because they, well, weathered and you know, damaged and so on. The tatami and we know it, right? So that's the reason. And everything else, the shadow, is an interesting metaphor for something what you don't see. In the Japanese art, if you look at any kind of uh, paintings, uh, this ink paintings, the untouched by the brush means more for the Japanese, the empty space, the void, than the one which has been touched by the brush. And the garden is the same thing. It obscures the totality. It's uh, nebulous. It's reconstituted in the memory. And it triggers the imagination. You are involved. You are part of it. You are creating in some sense. You are never given like in the Renaissance, this is yours and you are the ruler. Because mm -hmm. there are axes and so on. The borough did the same thing. It's never happened in gardens or in the environment and so on. But the shadow is metaphor, which you could read in the uh, 
wonderful book uh, in praise of Schindler. 1932 when he did it in the series and then now it's republished in English. What are your impressions as regards the natural city and the other culture? Are there any things we could incorporate? Yeah? Are there any are there any ideas we could use uh, in a wider sense of uh, the meaning of using something? I see a lot of transparency there, so you can uh, sometimes not really you don't have walls sometimes and you have openings everywhere uh, and, and, and this integration is uh, either by looking at it or really taking it uh, inside <coughs> mm -hmm. and that is uh, breaking it uh, off this uh, so it's uh, the, integra the integration is there um, and that is uh, something yeah, we, we might have see here more also. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, what um, uh, you know, Kuma is doing is he wrote a book about it. Is uh, the um, anti-object architecture as anti-object? An object is clearly defined is a solid box, right? If you anything what is uh, comes as perfectly definable depends on its boundaries. Now he is questioning this the boundaries. He uses these layers of filters through which uh, there is an ambiguity of the building. Yes, there are structures there, so he doesn't deny it, but this is a strategy to move it away from a drop-down uh, building which is there solidly. It is the cloud, it is the forest, it is, uh, how would one say that? It's an intention moving toward that. It will never really reach it. The other example which I showed it, it is the absolute minimum of architectural material. And um, Junya Ishigami comes out from a school, Sana is doing that. Everything is white, everything is elusive, almost nothing. Architecture of immaterial con conception. I use this term. And I showed only one uh, example. And the 305 columns there. Is that the way we go? Uh, perhaps not, but there is this example where in, uh, trying to um, do as little as possible. Well, it's, of course, he goes to the ex extreme. Yeah? I mean, I, I loved everything you show, and I, and I think what you're talking about is kind of a, a, a dissipation of the structure to the point of of it becoming almost ethereal because in, in some ways nature is so revered that anything we do it is almost an offense to it. Um, one of the, the bones you showed kind of remind me of Thorn Crown Chapel by, uh, by Faye Jones Faye in, in Arkansas and the process, at least I've taught my own students about it, is that the forest had to be so pristine that every piece of wood was cut so small so it had been dragged to the site and erected on site. Is that the way some of these are? To be in a pristine site like that, or do they come apart and then are erected right in a limited site? Well, I'm not quite sure if I understand precisely the question, but um, in case of Kumo, he uses the local material which is wrote in there and yes, he uses uh, craftsmanship in many ways. He uses, for example, uh, ask a craftsman from Kyoto who come in here and or into his building and fabricate uh, the building. But the local craftsmen are also actively uh, involved in that as they uh, using their ancient uh, skills and the high quality. Uh, but also prefabrication, I'm sure. The oh, there time. is prefabrication. Yeah. Oh, yes, there are prefabrication. And when I showed you uh, that building, it's a cross laminated wood uh, in, for example, in Zurich, which is a fabulous building without any metal. Uh, it's, I was stunned. <laughs> it's the structure itself. I was lucky to be there when it was still built. That is a long story. Yes. Was, uh, who's doing the statics for this? One, uh, I, I remember in Expo there was a building uh, made of bamboo, 
and they uh, in, in Germany, <laughs> so uh, they had to. Uh, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, get it uh, signed, uh, so they had to add uh, metal uh, connectors. I think they fixed the uh, uh, according to the rules. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know that building, uh, let me immediately uh, tell you, but it's Chicken Van who was using that. It was a vaulted structure, I believe, that's what we are talking about. Uh, it was a round, round one, not the, the big uh, one, the, oh, the I see. roof thing. Oh, then in that case, um, I and I think it was not Japan, it was Summer Asia. Maybe Vietnam or something. Well, I'm sorry, in that case. Whatever. Um, <laughs> but they, they weren't able to build it like they do right. here right. Yeah. due to the regulations. Yeah. In, 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 in Japan, they are very skilled in the bamboo. One of the best materials, the strongest, and it's a grass. Bamboo is a grass. And at the same time, it's the hardest wood what you gain from it. Beautiful structure. Beautiful. And Kuma uses it very. Very often it's full of China, it's full of bamboo, and so is Japan. I think you were yeah. didn't. Yeah. Uh, you asked what we can take over from that mm. for um, our um, countries here, Western countries. Uh, could you put, I think, the re, the uh, the rethink, the reuse, recycle, renovate, and uh, if we have okay. some more, the I think that is. No, it no, was the, the text. Uh, text uh, the text said uh, it is rebuild, reconnect. I think this is something for which we should consider. I think so. More and more. I think so. Well, I am putting this in front because right now in Japan, this is a movement. And why is it significant? Japan is known to be a country wherein the life expectancy of the building stock average in that was in the global economy was 18 years we know it precisely that a department store is 50 roughly plus minus mm -hmm. oh, it's a very complex system it, it is the land is very expensive what you build there is sometimes is a smaller part of the value of the land and so this is perhaps a very complex issue but now there must be something, and it's in the benefit of not just the architecture, but it's also the nature, and in the quality of the space in urban settings. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely welcome that. But it's an interesting point as regards our basic understanding of architecture, that the buildings are more or less long-lasting uh, mm. long entities. Right. No? And, and if we remove, if we reshift completely our perspective yeah. of what is architecture, also following these principles here, yeah. no? yeah. uh, and consider an, an, an ephemeral architecture, yeah. an architecture not designed to be long-lasting, but to have a certain lifespan. That's an, it's, a, it's a counter concept to the traditional mm -hmm. aspect. Another interesting point is as regards to the natural city and this and this divide, also as a in, as in basic inner image, this divide between inner and outer. The Greek definition of boundary, a boundary is not a straight line. The boundary is something where something different begins. It's a kind of transition zone. You know, that's a very interesting. If anybody knows uh, Aldo Van Eyck, the Dutch uh, wonderful architect who was a, a philosopher in many ways, and he talks about very similar to what perhaps Japan has been doing throughout the century, the mm. twin phenomena. It is, he refers to on the seashore and the beach. Mm -hmm. What is the boundary yeah. between the sea and the land? When the tide comes in and goes back, yeah. and when the waves come in, yeah. or when you look at the cloud, yeah. the taking the formations, anything what is coming about, when you were a kid, you look back up, the, uh, uh, mm. mom, look at this, this is a bear. Mm. And then as soon as you recognize that it was a bear, shifted yes. into something. Yeah, yeah. So when in, there are no sharp opposites in them, just as much as between nature and architecture is one. 
Mm -hmm. And if you look into the Zen gardens with mm -hmm. the pebbles, you meditate mm -hmm. right there. It is a vehicle of meditation. Mm -hmm. you, re re you relinquish your own whatever ego or identity you might have in order to uh, identify yourself with is there basically as a nothing because the stone garden is a, a, an absolutely almost um, how would one say that and uh, not just abstract mm. representation but it is um, well like in Zen Buddhism? Yeah, in Zen Buddhism. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, all that uh, yeah. stone cut. The point is, uh, also I want to make it explicitly sharp. I'm the advocatus in Diaboli again. I can say, okay, these principles are very good and have to be observed. Uh, in particular today, we have ecological problems and so on. We have to observe it, but we have also to observe these principles in terms of uh, bringing nature and culture. Culture is here, is here architecture. And architecture is the epitome of the, of the human made, of the artifact, of the artificial, of the non-organically grown per se. So let's take this, this mythic opposites. These are ideas, inner images. No? Not physical realities, but leading ideas. If we take this leading ideas of these of this opposites, what we can do in a Western culture, first question, because we are not Japan, we have another understanding and another history, and history is important as regards the shaping of inner images, not only of visible built space. This is one thing. And the other thing is, uh, what we do with the rest of the world as regards ecological problems, uh, as addressed shortly yesterday, we live worldwide in urban agglomerations around an estimated 2050, around 70% of the world population will live in urban agglomerations. And the urban agglomeration is not the city. Yeah? Uh, it is something different. It became a large, large jungle of a artificial second nature. Huh? And uh, inside these urban agglomerations around 2050, huh? an estimated two-thirds will live in slum-like conditions. And if you have seen cities like Delhi or Jakarta, uh, you do not even need a favela, so not the extreme of a slum. It is miserable. It's a mess, it's a jungle, according to our understanding at least. No? Uh, how to live there, what we do with this, how to, uh, yeah, what we do with this. And, uh, okay. Well, I, I uh, wrote a, a, a long article in 1997 in the Harvard uh, Architecture Journal, and it was um, entitled that what goes up must come down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, because of Japan. And the question is, at that time I raised, how long should a building last? When I was going through uh, the college, we anticipated that our modern building will last forever. And that carries our name and so on. And go to Japan and see these buildings, traditional and contemporary, regularly rebuilt, not to say anything about the Isa Shrine, which is they built 62 times by now and completely every 20 years. And then you are stunned. We are uh, worshipping the material entity, the, uh, the Egyptian pyramids, right? The stone is there. Uh -huh. It is still the same stone. It doesn't happen in Japan. When I am asking my students that when this building was built, I said, well, it was built several times. Uh, it was established way back in the third century. Then the war demolished it, rebuilt it. Then uh, came uh, the uh, disaster or whatever, and it was rebuilt again. And now the, the large construction companies, the world premier construction companies, come in here and rebuild the Katsura Villa. 
-hmm. They dismantled it <coughs> completely five years and okay. rebuilt it. Yeah. It's an interest please, please. Yeah, please. Um, I, I also like the idea of rebuilding and being more flexible. Yeah. But I think there are also some arguments from the other side. Surely not. In particular, if you look at Italy, I think there That's is. Uh, uh, yeah. well, when you read, I uh, recently read and I really think, feel that is their culture and nature is so in harmony. It would be <coughs> a pity if they would rebuild <laughs> this yeah, so, But we are talking about a completely different culture yeah. here. Yeah. Everything is basically <laughs> the entire history of Japanese architecture. Yeah. Uh, much of Asian cultures are the similar. Is of <coughs> the wood, of the thatch, of the tatami, which had to be regularly replaced. But the frame lasted a little bit longer, but the paper wall got damaged. The tatami was um, uh, absorbing humidity for which it was wonderfully uh, working. But it had to be replaced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regularly, the thatched roof had to be replaced. So there is this everything, yeah. how should I say, everything must pass. That is built into the mindset of, of the Japanese. So what they do, what they appreciate is exactly the creation. In fact, for them, in case of the Easter Shrine, architecture is not just an object. It starts eight years before it's reconstructed, because they go out and select the tree, then lumber it. And then comes a time when um, the two shrines, the rebuilt alternate shrines, then half a year they coexist. And then they transfer in the middle of the night, in the pitch dark, the sacred object to the new one, and after a time, they dismantle, they unbuilt the old one. It's wow. not the wrecking ball. They unbuilt it. And then distribute the material to the country, where it, the, or whatever is still salvageable, and they use it for other shrine buildings. Now, it is not the Greek temple. When you go there and it was 2,500 years ago, or the Egyptian pyramids, yeah, 3,000 years ago, this is not that one. This is, a, a, well, it is in the flow of time. And, uh, yeah. Okay. That's the, and, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, has the so often rebuilding of the temple a religious reason? Yeah, correct. Because it can't be, can't be for Egypt, for... Correct. The, the, the shrines, if I'm talking about, there are two types of religious architecture. Shinto is basically not a religion, so to say. Uh, if anybody is interested, we can talk about it. But the Shinto shrines have been traditionally rebuilt because every shrine is dedicated to a different kami, which is deity. So that Shinto is a pantheistic uh, worldview. It's directly related to the daily life of uh, people, how they have celebrated and so on. It's the spirit of place. Now, let me give you something. Um, if you go to New York, there is Sana's building the uh, a, a, a new museum in Bowery. What happened? They called the Shinto priest to New York with his entourage. He set up a, a Shinto shrine there a, a little bit, a small one and um, conducted the ceremony. And that's a ritual, which is, um, well, uh, blessing the sight, if it's a good word, we are using <coughs> Christian uh, kind of terminology. And then ask the protection of the building, which is because you disturb the land of, of that uh, spirit. Mm -hmm. And so you have to ask for the forgiveness and protection of the new one. Now, this is the yes, ritual. The rebuilding is providing in the cyclical uh, the recognition in nature that everything mm -hmm. comes and goes, and comes and goes. So architecture as part of the nature becomes ritualized quite mm -hmm. clearly. Now, this um, ritual, which was at some point every shrine, they could somehow afford it. But now it's so expensive, millions of dollars. And keep it in mind, nobody can see it. Nobody can see it. 
It's surrounded by four fences, and it's only the, uh, the emperor and the chief priest of Shinto. Um, this is a very, very long and very complex cultural uh, baggage mm -hmm. into which architecture plugs in, and it's inseparably part of it, just as much as nature is. Now, I'd like to add to it that what we heard yesterday. Japanese cities are tremendously dense. I don't know how long that will prevail now. But nature is really everywhere in spots, disposed of in little gardens, um, private residences, and so many other places. It's there for, uh, for the Japanese. And Ando was recognizing that that was in the industrial age when it was missing. He said, I am against that city. And then he was not alone, but he was leading this. That's why he was called the urban guerrilla, an anti-urban movement, because of those conditions which were imposed then on the city by way of the reckless developments. Now, let me tell you, I was there um, 73, 74. The pollution was awful. They had displays, digital displays that had them. Uh, monoxide and uh, carbon monoxide and everything was there, nitrogen. And so you could see what you were breathing in. It's way much better now, but the issue is global now. It's not just China. So it's inescapable. And yes, we need to recycle. We need really to protect whatever we have. But it's the economy into which architecture is always part of it. Yeah. Other power, yeah. the interest of, of a lot of things. Yes. Maybe the shorter cycles also bring adaptability to uh, new forms of living. I mean, we do have a problem with uh, the sizes of the uh, flats that we have in the houses. Yeah. It doesn't fit to the uh, living conditions anymore. Right. Uh, and so on. So that is uh, really uh, something. But yeah. it might not be easy because uh, if you reconstruct your things, mm. you might also place things uh, yes. besides that do not belong behind each other and, you, you uh, know, and so on. There are many, many forces which uh, move toward um, re uh, rebuilding, building completely new. And sometimes it's much cheaper to completely demolish a building than, uh, say, to renovate. That's, that's a, a, now, what makes a building obsolete? It's the technology. Uh, it's the frame perhaps is okay, but if you go to a building, I'm sure we are architects, and then I went down to a, a relatively large building. It's a computer. The building is a computer. You go in there, you have the cameras, right? That's just for safety, they say. They control. But they control the lighting. Nature. <laughs> Nature and order. We already have it. And so the, what makes a building obsolete is the tremendous development of technology. Yeah, this is one aspect. And the other aspect is culture. A natural city has yeah. to come back to the general city. Uh, culture means heritage. Yes. No? And uh, not just economy and technology. May I make a proposal? This is a very, very interesting theme, but a little bit with a look to time. Huh? I'm sorry, I have to manage these things here. And this, is, this is not very creative, I know, but uh, from, the, from the topic huh? uh, and uh, from these principles, from these basic yeah. principles, now we look for, we can look for the next presentation uh, Can I say yeah. one more thing? Yeah, yeah, please, come on. I, the, you don't have to answer, but I, I, I see uh, an interesting connection in between rebuilding, participation, and making sense of a place where people actually can can contribute. Yeah, uh, basically that's what core is of that. that it is, um, in Japan is done uh, a little bit differently. I don't want to spend too much time with that, but yes. The, um, the construction company is actively involved, interest in that, and they take pride of that. 
Mm. And the architect and the construction company are not antagonistic. If you go to the US, my goodness, litigation is all around. In, in, in Japan, it's they work together. It is the pride of the construction company that they have done that. Uh, even the, uh, the, the new stadium, the, the competition proceeds by the architect immediately identifying, they team up with the construction company, and then they propose. And Toyoito lost because of whatever, they were two in this competition. So hard it was uh, sent, and then he got hot in for I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, but I know he was absolutely, she was absolutely furious because of that. But it was a right decision, anyway. I think the word that you didn't use, I guess maybe touch on with Italy, was historic preservation. And so in the United States, there's this is true sense of historic preservation that everything is frozen in time. Right. And I we've done some work with the, the uh, Pueblo yeah. Indians in the yeah. Southwest, and you did yeah. mention adobe. And they believe that every year you need to put another coat on of the adobe mud. That's right. And the preservation community is so angry with that because it's changing something. And they say, this is a living, breathing architecture. That's right. And if we don't teach the younger people how to take care and you know, maintenance of the buildings is so important as well. And I, I see real tie in that in those cultures. Yeah, but preservation very often in, in the West, even in our school, uh, uh, falls into that trap that they want to freeze time. Yes, right. But they don't recognize that what they want to preserve is a particular time when it was, and it must have been completely different. Well, well we use that phrase, uh, era of significance. That's right. Yes. That's right. Well, that's an interesting point, the significance. And this other, so potentially, this completely other perspective in terms of worldview and the basic understanding of what is architecture at all mm -hmm. means in the end in, in our dichotomy natura, cultura, nature, culture what is culture at all? If we can understand the significance is also in the not everlasting and mm -hmm. the significance is, is uh, not in the ephemeral but uh, like in this Japanese approach we, we accept significance uh, for a certain period of time. Huh? It's not forever. Huh? And, then, and then we can continue with building something different. Even we could try and experiment with something different. We do not have to rebuild the same Shinto shrine. We, we could make something new and it would be a completely different understanding of culture and of cultural heritage altogether. As a perspective. Yeah, if you have a question to whom I, I would like to add, you said significant for a certain time, and of course, depending on what it is and which purpose it has, and also in which environment it is, the time can be longer or shorter. As also, if you mm -hmm. refer to nature, everything is recycled, but the time scale is extremely different between trees that can be almost thousand years and some Sorry. annual, yes, maybe it's thousand a bit too much, but uh, yes, um, some annuals that live only, or some animals live only a very short time. So um, yeah, I think that we can also learn that it, then we can make difference between different uh, type of uh, buildings. I, I agree, and uh, you know, well, uh, not every building is worthwhile saving. Yeah. They have to go. I mean, they're simply the fact of life of a building. But what I am advocating here is that so far in China and Japan, and China followed Japan, they didn't discriminately erase whatever heritage they had simply because of the name of modernization and what they did. No, yeah. and, 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 and a kind of no man's land which came up. So what I'm advocating that those which are worthwhile, partially at least, able to be saved, mm -hmm. they should be, and rebuilt yeah, into yeah. something reappropriated, adaptive reuse. Mm -hmm. And I think I am pleased to see that it's taking hold now. Not just when I'm coming back from China and I see that too. They recognize that the foreigners which built in their Zahadi and whomever is a disaster. So the new generation, both in Japan and now followed by perhaps China, recognizes that there is a wisdom 
what they had accumulated throughout the centuries, millennia, could be harnessed. Yeah. This is this case of this Italian city. Huh? Uh, what, what do you have? Uh, it is close to nature or city like Siena or Florence. You cannot destroy it. It's a different concept of culture and of architecture. Okay, but we cannot destroy it. But how to combine it? This is a very interesting question for the final discussion. Sure. Huh? Uh, now, I would propose that Tim Kaisers presents in a positive sense of utopia uh, the ideas of a Phyto city, this is one step further than the Japanese approach. No? This is an occidental approach, one step further than the, Je <laughs> in the Japanese, in that way that we, even in the architectural forms and the Gestalt, the basic yeah. Gestalt, we bring the city back to nature and not vice versa. Well, in the meantime, I want to thank you. Uh, yeah.